Cisco, uh, Microsoft, uh, Accenture, any of those companies who have been there for a long time knew this and had their uh, distant sales team work out of this just to make sure the economics of selling uh, come in play, right? And as we talk of what is remote selling, we are talking here and some point of time, if you understand, if you are trying to reach out to a prospect or a customer, the first thing that you might do is to take a phone and call them, right? That's where an entire industry of inside sales begin. It's just picking up the phone and trying to reach somebody over and trying to make discussions thereafter. But when it comes to remote selling, it's not just limited to having a telephone call made and have a discussion later on. It, it's a whole gamut of things that you need to do or you need to prepare yourself to get on a call. Uh, so for example, uh, today we want to do this webinar. How can we do this? We need to have a tool in place that will make sure that hundreds of people join. We need to have a video sharing platform that can facilitate mostly uh, how people interact with each other, to take questions, to present some things, and people have discussions in between. Right, so all this preparation needs to happen. Similarly, for every call that you go in, you need to understand who is your customer, what is their business model, what are they trying to sell, who is their audience, who are they trying to push, who are they trying to make business with. All of this information is rightly available today if you go on the webs and figure it out. Uh, there are different tools. We'll talk about them as we go through. But what I'm trying to tell you here is, guys, if you, if you move forward and consider sales as a function. There is 300% growth over traditional sales in the last a decade alone. And this is just not happening for the heck of it. It's happening because how industry is moving, how technology is facilitating it. Now, there is another understanding that I get to here is this, uh, Discovery Org told us that 78% of the decision makers make their decisions remotely, which means they do not want to have a handshake and waste their time coming in for a coffee meet or a dining meet or, or any of that meetings. They do not want to do that. They want to just do their business and move on. Similarly, we also heard from sales benchmark index that 70% of the customer don't even want to meet you, which is exactly good in many ways. For bigger and larger organizations, it might be the other way because their uh, influencing factors to make uh, a deal happen are way different from an inside sales perspective. And those are the complications that we're gonna talk. How is it important to be figuring all those factors before you make a decision on to move towards an inside sales or an outside sales, right? Uh, the general understanding of inside sales org is it's very economical, right? You have 10 people sitting here and making calls rather than 10 people on the field, walking, driving, taking bus, taking trains or planes and, and costing you that much. Uh, to reach to your customers. That is very critical. So that becomes much more effective. So you might end up doing much more calls. You might end up talking to many people and then the pipeline gets bigger and fatter, right? Now, as I said, it is now the preferred way of talking. Everybody understand phone is the simplest way to pick up and talk to somebody. And that has given wings to how people want to talk anymore. Uh, it also gives you better collaboration, right? somebody wants to know something about me can go and find about it on LinkedIn. So my entire history of services would be there. So knowing that you can actually have a better conversation when you are in front of the customer, knowing what his background, what he's trying to accomplish, what he's doing today and many other important things. So the collaboration and the rapport building becomes a lot more simpler rather than just walking up to. So I remember there used to be days when we call it elevator pitch. And what is an elevator pitch? In those days, it was very simple. You will not get somebody's appointment very easily. So wherever you find him or her, you will just walk up to them and try to deduce, introduce yourself and talk about what you're trying to offer. And those were the elevator pitches. I hope everybody understands that and remembers those days because those were uh, you know, very funny days to me because I'm running around and trying to get to somebody to talk. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they are not interested. And it takes a lot of persistence and commitment to get somebody to come to a table and talk to you. All right. So this way, we actually have a better collaboration because we just not need to get to that person that we are trying to reach to, but also we can reach to many other people within that company or through many other channels that we have available today. All right. We do not have to walk to their office every day, stand at their gate and try for our appointment. We don't have to do that anymore. 
that's the best part of this. Um, and, and there are many things in play. As we spoke about tools, we'll talk in detail about what tools can do. But uh, those, are, those are the next step of sales. That gives you much more intelligence information that is really required to run today's functions. So let's talk about the basic differences between an inside and outside sales. What is inside and outside sales? Inside sales people, you know, to be exactly uh, from an outside perspective, uh, they look at down and say, hey, listen, these guys always sit on their chair, they warm their chair up, what they do? We have to run around in the sun and get things done, which is true, exactly true. Now, all of this matters in a different way. Uh, the first thing that you need to look at is why inside sales or outside sales is not the point. The point is, what is your company doing? What are they trying to accomplish? How complex is your product? How complex is your selling uh, method? Or how process oriented is your entire sales pipeline look like, right? So that defines if it is easy to go with inside sales and an outside sales. To sell, just to give you an example, guys, to sell a basic telephone, you have to reach a mass audience. And that cannot happen through inside sales or an outside sales. But to sell a credit card, a credit card we sold through an inside sales because you just need to pick up a phone, know your audience, try to tell them what's the advantage, and then talk to them. But can you do a credit card sale on an outside sales model? In fact, it would be too much of a trouble to do so, right? So that's what uh, the basic difference is. It totally depends upon what you're trying to sell, who you're trying to talk to, uh, what is your methodology around it, and everything else, right? So if you look at it, there's a huge difference in between this is because one more thing important apart from being in office or traveling is uh, the revenue or the pipeline. In an in inside sales model, it is basically a, a fast paced model uh, where you need to do many businesses. You have to run many deals simultaneously and close many deals at the same time because the value of those would be very less. Fortunately, unfortunately, for all the things that you need to do in an outside sales business, generally people pick that model to make sure that the deal sizes are very large and the process required to accomplish that is also something very similar, right? So the pipeline for a inside sales model will look like a martini glass, which has a very you know, concave uh, way and a very simple, small thin pipe coming down. Whereas an outside uh, sales would have a, how would you say it? A, it's like a glass, a beer glass to be said, which will be always, you know, wide enough from the top to the bottom because the, the conversion on a outside sales model would be a little more larger with the wheel sizes being very high. I hope it's making sense. Let's move on. So as I was talking about, there are different ways of collecting content and from Facebook to Twitter to every LinkedIn page or a professional page that you see, it's all about information. What we need to understand is the quality and accessibility is always there, but how do we use them to our advantage is very critical. So for an inside sales team, as we talk about, uh, it's very easy to sit around and do all the research and try to approach, but it's very complex for an outside sales people because it's very limited time. They have to travel, they have to do many things in between and then do all of that, right? But uh, for an inside sales business, the time consuming part for every rep is to do research. And that research does not stop over looking at, hey, how big is the company? What is the business model? How many reps do they have or what they're trying to sell? It's not limited to that. They also go through understanding what is this guy's behavior, characteristics. Sometimes they go beyond figuring out uh, if this guy is uh, you know, a sports person or something else and what will uh, try to strike a conversation with him. Remember this, these guys are behind the phone. They do not have a face to this whole conversation as well. So uh, it's, it becomes more complex to strike a conversation in the first three seconds, which is critical for every outbound call that you make, right? Uh, within three seconds, if the customer is not interacting or the prospect is not interacting with you, you might end up that call in next three seconds. So the better prepared you are, better chances of making a good conversation and that way you can move on with the next steps. Uh, unfortunately, fortunately, with inside sales model, there are two types of uh, uh, model that exist today. One is purely an inbound model, and one is purely an outbound model. 
an inbound model versus an outbound model, there is only simple difference. An inbound model totally depends upon marketing mix and marketing functions to generate leads. Whereas an outbound is purely the traditional approach of reaching out and cold calling, emailing, getting them to talk to you in some form or shape and making things happen. So those are the basic difference. But fortunately, unfortunately, many companies have to pick between one of these as they are a startup or a growing company or in a growth phase or in you know, an enterprise world because there is a gamble with that. Uh, the simplest gamble between these two is some people have a lot of money in the beginning. So they end up spending most uh, in their marketing activities to build their brand, to build their loyalty, to build their visibility and everything else. But some people do not have that money. So they end up hiring two or three people, asking them to go cold calling, figure out who their customers are, or possibly get uh, associated with a loyalty program or customer uh, references, which gives them a kickstart to run the presentation. So the whole gamut of this totally depends upon how much money you have or what is your marketing mix and how fast you want to grow, based on which you will pick an inbound model and outbound model. So let's take more into understanding of those things. As I was talking about lead generation, uh, the marketing mix defines the contribution percentage of the demand jet, right? Generally, it's expected to do 25 to 45% uh, over a pipeline that you need to have. And in high growth companies like Freshworks, we need to do more than 60% because we are in a volume business, right? And how would you do this beyond uh, the normal, normal marketing mix, which is basically a paid media or a content-driven strategy that, um, you know, that includes SEO, SMM, uh, AMO, and many other things. Now, it's interesting uh, that a rep can do some of this on their own, right? For an outbound model, you have a lot more ways to engage people today. You can optimize your social presence. As I was saying, you can have a LinkedIn profile, a social profile, or, or a very professional profile, which you can do use to educate people, reach out people and connect them over different groups or even different blog writing that you can do. So you can create your own brand in some form or shape. So with that, people will know about who you are, where you're working, what you're doing, what you're trying to do. And definitely today's world, as everything has turned into videos, people do not have time to read through many things that you send their way. So it's easier to create some interesting content, which is video traffic. And that makes a lot of life easier. Now, everybody's on YouTube. Now, who doesn't go to YouTube today? I know my kids go to YouTube every day to just listen to rhymes, right? So everyone on the go wants to listen to something that they don't have to gaze their eyes on. Even people driving actually tend to hear today's, uh, there are books, which is eBooks, which can talk to you, right? You don't have to read any more books. That's very interesting. So that way, everything is uh, becoming some form of audio or video content, which is very critical today to engage. Now, one of my rep, uh, when we started with a video content uh, to reach out and do our outbound model was to shoot himself and say, hey, hey guys, I'm the new rep here. And if you want to talk to me, here is my number. How do you think that would go? Yeah, it, it blasted him back. Uh, that was the worst thing to do. Now that was a learning for him to understand not every video needs to be just about himself. Sometimes when you're trying to reach somebody, you need to talk to them in terms of what they want to listen to. Today, everybody's making money on video content on YouTube and every other channel. Uh, how are they making it happen? How are they making more monies or how are they getting more views to them? So there's a huge segment or rather, we need to study about how to make a better content there. So that, that becomes a huge element. I really want to focus there because that's where uh, today when we have everybody distant so much, we totally depend upon digital conversations and this becomes one of the best source to do so, right? Now, there is another way of doing all of this. We are doing this one right now. We are doing a webinar. You know, a lot of webinars have interesting content to share. Some of them are pure educational. Uh, some of them are pure, you know, uh, trying to teach you how to handle certain scenarios. Some people talk about psychology. Some people talk about how to work uh, in terms of, you know, uh, so some of the senior coaches in the industry, 
try to experiment during this lockdown time. And that was interesting to see. I want to share some case study here. So this person, I don't want to name him, um, did a negative publicity about himself. He said, hey, I am losing everything, guys. I need help. Now, this guy used to be the top sales guy and everybody looked up to him. How do you think this will go? It went viral because nobody expected that to come from him. As everybody knows, uh, today, if you send one negative wave, it creates thousand more waves. So negative words spread faster than a positive word. And that exactly brought him back. So everybody tried to reach out to him and say, hey, what happened to him? Why is he so low? Why is he reacting that way or this way? In fact, he said, I'm going bankrupt, which was totally fake. He was just trying to get his attention back. Now, this could be a good thing or this could be a bad thing because many people care about him. And whoever tried to reach out to him with empathy knew he's in trouble or thinking he's in trouble. And when he said, no, I'm just trying to do a, a test here, it, it fire as well, right? It backfires. So you have to be very careful how you do it and make sure that uh, what you want to spread is very clean and transparent. So make sure that you do that and build a win-win strategy around it. You also need to make sure that who you're engaging with. So for example, some of the medias today of end up sharing social media like Facebook or Twitter or everywhere, it, it's tweeting everywhere, right? Everybody talks about tweeting. Now, why, why do you want that much of propaganda? You have to be very careful when you do any of these because it can backfire. Yes, it can backfire, but it can also create a lifelong impression that you don't want. So you have to be very careful with all those video creations and what you're sharing. Uh, you can use negative reversing, of course, but you have to be very careful in terms of what audience are you targeting. So look at that. Every time you are trying to reach somebody or trying to talk to somebody, the interest changes, your audience change. So be careful to that. Be agnostic to how you want to influence them and amplify your message as well. That way you do not have to worry majorly about how things are moving, right? Now, with that said, if we all do one thing is to buy online, what do we do a couple of things every time? We go looking for a product, we try to discover about all the features, capabilities of that product, and then look for so many comments on it, reviews on it, and see if it is right or wrong. And then we figure out where is the best product available, yeah, of course, but we also look for where is the best lowest price available as well. So one thing we need to understand is by the time somebody's trying to make a decision, they've already done a hell lot of work on their own. Now, this not used to be the case historically. Historically, if you are a sales guy, you know you're the only person the customer is talking to to even understand what you have to offer. And then maybe he will sit with you for months and months to understand how does that fit into his lifestyle or his process or his problems. That has changed. Before we even talk to people, they already know what they want. And they also know who they're going to buy from. But again, one more thing being a human happens is mostly it's psychological. That is, we intend to make decisions with a lot of logics, but also emotionally. So for example, I'll give you a case study, a kind of experience that I had with my customer. So I have many reps who work for me, right? And one of the rep was, for, was a fresher uh, who has just started selling and didn't know much about all of these things. So he just started talking, picked up the phone and started talking, hey, Mr. Customer, nice to, nice to know you're interested in our products. I wanted to share more about it. The customer was like, hey, listen, I'm doing a trial with you. I already know about your product. Why are you wasting my time? Now, that's a bad experience, right? Now, this rep should have gone in and checked if the guy is doing much more things already, what else he's doing. We should have figured before calling in. But there was another experience where, similar scenario, he's already going through a trial, and this experienced person says, hey, Mr. Customer, I see you're doing a trial with this, and I see you have spent a lot of time. I really want to know what you're trying to solve for. Where do you think the customer would be happy, right? The same guy, two different approach. The first approach backfired because like, you have not even looked at who I am and what I'm doing. The second one was, hey, you spend some time learning what I'm trying to do and you have seen what I'm doing, so let me talk more to you. The importance here is, let me talk more to you. 
And that opens up the customer in terms of what he was not willing to talk to you about. So many times, a lot of things happen during conversation. And one thing doesn't happen during conversation is trust building. If you gauge the customer is very much apprehensive about what he's sharing and what he's not sharing with you, then you have to be very careful in terms of how you interact with him or how you get his trust uh, you know, on your side. And if you're able to do so, then it's very easy to go through the next phases. But it's also critical to use that trust to figure out and see if there is more dust to uncover, right? Many times we leave a lot of our money on sales calls on the table. And that happens because we do not ask very much the hard questions. And we are afraid of asking hard questions. Why? Because we do not know how he's gonna react. And that's very much happening uh, over an inside sales model because we never know who is on the other end. How does he look like? What is he wearing today? What mood he's on? And is he interested to talk to me or not? Right? And in these scenarios, it becomes very much, you know, it, it, it's, it is difficult to really gauge somebody's attention and get to understand the tone that he's talking to you and figure out, hey, he's not in a good mood today. And if you have that experience to understand people's psychology, how they're reacting to you and why are they reacting to you, it becomes a lot more simpler to do that. So as I was saying, 70% of their journey is already over while they come to you. And to make that easier, if you're trying to help him and become a consultant or some value addition to it, then only he would love to talk to you. And then the deal will happen. Even though there would be three more people under him who would have done future benefit analysis one-on-one -on -one with other competition, they might still go with you because you gave them the leverage, you gave them the trust, you gave them that, hey, you can work with me and I will be there for you all the while, right? That makes a huge difference. Let's move on how an inside sales team should look like or could look like. As I was saying, there are two different models of uh, you know, inside sales, which is purely outbound model or an inbound model. As I was saying, inbound model is purely dependent on the marketing driven leads, which is from webinars, SEO, content driven, and then many other things that you do during a marketing platform. And on an outbound model is purely you try to find your audience, pull a list of them, figure out what is the best approach to get to them and try to reach them and make sure that you qualify them or disqualify them. And then on there on, there are people who can close and there are people who can take them for an account management perspective. So that's a simple way of uh, you know, approaching an inside sales model. However, there could be complex model between which there could be pre-sales, solution consultants, many other people could be involved if the product is complex the selling process is complex we'll see some of these and how it, we can work through that right so some of the best practices in inside sales that benefit everybody is to clearly define what is your buyer journey is what is a buyer's journey the buyer's journey sometimes people call it sales pipeline right uh, it could be as simple as creating a new opportunity to nurturing them to doing a demo or a trial or a POC, then doing a whole set of paperwork and then closing them. That could be one. Or it could be another one. We'll talk about that in a bit. Well, I'll, I'll deep dive into a, a scenario and talk to you in more ways of that. Then we also talk about what is our sales process? What is our support for buyer's journey? How do we support that whole process? How is our document sharing happens, how is our information sharing happens, and many other things in between, right? And then we also think about, all of this is done, now we are talking to somebody who's not a decision maker. Is that product relevant to him? Yes, it is, because there are two kinds of people. One who can actually influence the whole process, one who can actually make a decision on top of that. So you have to be very careful in terms of how you identify those persona, and how that impacts your daily routine. And then we can talk about, you know, how you can do it more personalized. As I was talking, the more information available all through the way in terms of knowing your customer better, uh, you can now think about getting more customized and personalized in the way you message them, right? So if somebody wants to approach me on LinkedIn and try to get a connection over me, what would you say? Hey, I saw your profile, we're interested. Uh, want to talk and want to connect. Would you accept that? I might not. Who is, who are you? 
why you're trying to reach me would be the first question I would be going through in my mind. And same as every customer would do the same. But if you make a change there and try to engage them in a much more simpler way, hey, listen, I saw your uh, an ex Oracle or you know, some connection that you can find which is common and then use that to build up a whole story around why you want to get connected and what you're gonna do after get connected, that makes a difference. Why wanna I waste time with somebody who I don't know and just want to be connected to me, rather somebody who has an agenda after connection, right? So we will talk about how to personalize some of these and how to make it much more meaningful as we move forward. And everything else should be driven around numbers and everybody knows there are a lot of metrics available in the market or in your team, depending how you function today, that will define what makes a difference in your company or growth. I want to talk a little bit about how business models adopt different types of uh, methodologies of selling, right? If you know in 1950s, when telemarketing came into existence, the whole, wo whole world does one thing. Pick up the phone, pick up the list and call. Though it was a cold call and you never know who's on the other end, and what you're trying to sell, but you only knew, okay, he has some money, he's ready to buy. That's all you will know. And then on those scenarios, what would you do? You would talk about features. Hey, I have a huge uh, acre of land. Would you be interested? Right? And then you will talk about, hey, it's right next to the main road. It's right next to the, you know, uh, water wall, whatever it is. You will talk about more features to sell that land. And later on, when people, you know, People had ways to travel. Every time people had ways to travel, but they never looked around what they want or not. So the real estate industry changed a bit because people wanted to go see what they're buying or probably looking around whenever they're traveling and see what they like and then call somebody to buy for it. They changed a bit. They wanted to sell something that they didn't know about. No, they wanted to sell something to somebody with a spin knowing that he won't be interested, but making him think about, hey, this is the thing that he won't, should be interested in. They started using a spin technology or a re negative reversing uh, to make them feel, okay, you're gonna lose a big world if you don't buy this, right? This is the last trend. Some people turn it to an ego selling. Hey, your neighbor has 10 acres of land, why don't you, right? So many, many methodologies came into play as people evolved, as our information evolved, as our you know, transport industry involved, and also the technology. The later came a uh, very interesting way of selling is problem selling. Now, uh, what is a basic example for problem selling? If you figure out somebody is doing good, then there is no way to sell something to them. Then you have to figure out a problem to sell them. Then you will create a problem to sell them. So most of the time, uh, what you end up doing, hey, you have a bike, fantastic. What is the CC? Then somebody says, oh, I have uh, some 150 CC and a 40 CC, 80 CC, whatever it is. Then you talk about, oh, interesting. Look, I have a higher user. What is the problem statement there? Problem statement is very simple. You have less horsepower, I have more horsepower. You created that problem for him, think, making him think egoistic and also think about, hey, listen, you're going like a you know, bullock cart. I'm going like a jet plane. What do you want to do? So those complex scenarios came in, people started creating problems for them because they do not find out any other ways to sell. But that was not going for a long time because people realized they're trying to create something which is not necessary for them and people ended up buying unnecessary stuff uh, through TV channels. So ACV, if you know that channel, uh, used to be one of the biggest ones which used to sell many products to you, um, you know, on TV, right? So that was an interesting time. They created problems for you which you were not even aware of. I never knew that broomstick needs to have a handle. They need to be cleaned without touching them and everything else around it. They taught me that. So I picked up another problem on my own without knowing that I need that, right? So now if you look at the technology in terms of broomsticks has evolved so much that we don't need to worry about just the vacuum cleaners anymore, but there are many ways to do it much more effectively. So innovation did help, but that didn't fly much long. So people start thinking, hey, he's creating additional problems for me. Why should I buy and hold a lot of things around me? And why should I be you know, uh, spending so much money unnecessarily? So then came the consultatory way. That's when the whole uh, service industry took place and very much critical 
uh, to that world if you understand if you're not consulting somebody in terms of what challenges they are going through or what their problems are uh, you might not have a way in there right so how do you consult today you can be a friend you can be a, a you know a neutral person or you can be very close and uh, deep dive into the problems and solve for them, right? There are many ways of doing consultation today. The best of consultation uh, was presented by a case study when they showed how doctors sell. If you look at doctors, I'm not, I'm not trying to take that profession out of the way, but I'm just trying to tell you, every time you go to them, who is talking more, you or them? It, it is where the 80-20 rule came into play, where 80% time you need the customer to talk and 20% time you talk. And it is very critical today because if you do not let the customer talk, he has already made his decision on his back because he has done some research. And that is a scary point. So people started doing this. They, people had information at their hands, so they do their back work and homework and everything and then come back. Or while the sales guys would do this, they will ask questions and stay quiet. And these questions were not doing good enough because they were not opening many people. So they figured out their ways of asking questions. They are open-ended questions, closed questions, and many other formats of questioning. And they went in psychological study to even define why a criminal is questioned and how is it questioned, right? So not everyone break every time to say, oh, I commit, I did the mistake. So people went that far to understand the psychological uh, uh, you know, thought process of people and how they behave to study in terms of how I can be more consultative. If I do not know who I'm in front of, how would I consult? And how do you know? In, 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 while they were doing this psychological study, they also uh, understood one interesting thing is, you know, there are people who call uh, 800 numbers, uh, which do not need to give you number or name of yours uh, to tell them what you're calling for. And some of these cases are suicide cases, right? And it's, it's very challenging to even tell them anything in that point of time because they just called you in asking for help. Hey, I have a suicide tendency and I don't know how to go about it. And you, on the other hand, you're trying to consult him without knowing anything about it, right? So this, this exactly scenario happens when customers are online. You do not know much about him suddenly when he comes on call and you're trying to figure out, oh, this is not the guy I was trying to look for and this is a different guy and now I need to deviate my whole conversation in the way I want it and possibly come to a conclusion. Now, every time a sales guy get on a call, he has one thing in mind, always be closing. What is always be closing? He has to have an action item every time he ends a conversation with the customer. It could be anything from, hey, I need to set up another time with you to talk more. Or to, hey, what is the next step? Who is, who is next involved in this process? Who do we need to talk to? What is the process of uh, doing pricing? How do we get to paperwork done? So all of that, right? So it became very critical to understand those psychological patterns and how to interact and make sure that you are there. Um, that became so much that people got to know about how it influences their decision-making process. Uh, they, that they started hiding most of the information. Even if you're the best sales guy or psychological guy, a suicide tendency guy will not tell you everything, right? He will hide some of those details until he breaks. And most of the time, sales guys would not have that much time on a call or uh, to make somebody, you know, break. So that didn't fly. Then we started figuring out, okay, what else can we do? Now we have done feature selling. We have done, you know, we're putting a negative reverse to everything by saying, hey, is this a good time to saying, did I catch you at a bad time? That, that's a spin, right? If you understand, uh, generally, if I call somebody and say, hey, is this a good time to talk to you? He will say, no, who are you, right? Where else if I say, hey, sorry, I caught you at the wrong time. I hope I didn't bother you, but I have a few questions to ask. Would you have three minutes or five minutes to answer some of these questions? Okay, what are those? So there's a huge difference in terms of how people react to what you do. So people evolved. They asked through all of these and then figure out, okay, this is not working. We need to do a little bit more beyond this. So they started thinking about how to add values. And, and you must be thinking, what is a value addition? What is a value selling? So uh, for a car owner, if you think about a car owner, there are a couple of, you know, rather, there are many types of car owners. One who would just want to commute from one place to another. 
The other guy might be thinking about more comfort. The other guy would be thinking about, hey, I have more money, so I need to show my money. So I need to buy a different car. Or some people who are just pure luxurious. Some people are speed fanatics. They need speed. Some people are four by fours. They want to do outdoors. They want to go into jungles and climb anywhere with their, you know, whatever they own. So different people have different needs. And once we understand how to handle those needs apart from features and benefits and talk to them in that value, it becomes much more easy to have a conversation. So for example, uh, if you're talking to a, a possible person who's trying to buy an 800, I'm just giving you a, you know, example like you don't take me up for it uh, but i'm just trying to make you understand if you're talking to a person who's trying to buy an 800 and you show him the gentle thing is you show him a volkswagen or a mercedes what do you think you will go with you will go with most likely the middle one which is the volkswagen um, but fortunately or unfortunately that guy might have a different opinion why he should go with the volkswagen and why should he not go with a Mercedes? Mercedes, of course, being expensive and everything else, he's not there. That's why he's buying 800, but Volkswagen is in between that. So he might just push up a budget on his side, figure out how he can you know, get the money for, and then move up that ladder. But he won't do, he will not step into that whole conversation and mindset until you make him think about it, right? What does a sales car salesman do first is to make, customer sit inside the car and do a test drive and why does everybody think about a test drive why would people do you know trials and you know POCs and everything because they want to have a real life experience with whatever they're buying and which is critical so as you see a value for an, a guy who's just wanting to go from one A to B is 800 is good enough? Yes, exactly. That is more than enough. In his, the traffic conditions that we are in, that's the smallest car and that, that will do because it gives you mileage and everything around, right? That's the best for him. But if you want to push him up value and sell him a Volkswagen, um, you have to show him a little bit more and why and how you have to figure out that value, right? It's not the feature of the car anymore. Feature of the car could go as, as luxurious as, it, you know, I have an umbrella within the car, like what? you know, Rolls Royce would do with the same brand and everything. But what you need, really need to think about is this guy has a very limited need. How would you increase his need? We have to differentiate between your services to values, features to values. So the car became an element of feature. The values could be anything from, hey, listen, There are many different formats and types of content available around the world, on internet especially, uh, which talks about why you should buy one and why you should not buy the other, right? So you have already made your perception, assumption, and everything in between, right? Now, if you come with all that information on your head and try to understand how, these are, how this is going to work for you, then it's, as a salesperson, you are at a big time loss because you do not know what that guy is gone through even if you try to go through the entire internet you will not know what exact content he went through and why he's making a decision on that way right so what is critical to you is uh think about you know how do you make sure he's comfortable with his decision also think about you do not want to change much of his decision there all that you need to do is make sure that you assist him in buying a better product and how would you do that you need to be very empathetic with that person. You need to be, uh, you know, you need to be very transparent with that person. You need to be very honest to that person in terms of how this can make a difference. And that way you will understand how things can improve in his life, your business, and how sales can happen. Cool. I'll stop there. I'll take some of the questions if you have any. And it uh, looks like there are a couple more questions on the queue. Uh, Nirmal, is that okay to go ahead and take some questions there? Yes, please. Yes, please. In fact, uh, SR has a few. 
Okay. Uh, you want to open up to the voice or you want to open yeah. up just to chat? Okay. You, could, you could even come on video. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. If you can, uh, Shaiju, if you can on the video. Yeah, sure. One second, guys. My net is going in and out. All right. There okay. we are. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Shaiju. In fact, uh, thank you for a uh, very good presentation. Uh, there had been, uh, in your later part of it, uh, predominantly you had been uh, uh, dwelling on the, the process of uh, sales and how do you go about with this, etc. Uh, in fact, if you really look at it, both uh, inside sale or outside sale, so many things that you mentioned by you are common to most of them, you know, whether it is a customer trust that you take or consultative selling that you do uh, or, or, or go with the customer inputs, etc. Whether it is an inside sale, outside, it's, it's, all, it's all good. So uh, I would rather uh, try to take some input from you related to, see, uh, we are going through the COVID times, Shaiju, okay. Now, absolutely, an organization which has been predominantly in the outside sales, is sales staff, etc., that they have been doing, that is not happening. Now, sitting inside, and they can't even, in product, in most of the cases, they can't even go into the offices, but if they want to set this up, their they, they sales team or inside sales team, etc., how they will be able to get across to, how they will be able to get across to the client. So, predominantly here, there's a challenge of the culturally, they have been doing uh, outside sales uh, activities now trying to bring all this into it into through your insights so how what sort of a what sort of an advice can you give it to those people who really do not have an inside sales and they would like to set up an inside sale in, with relation to both infrastructure as well as the going about how, how to go about with this will you be able to give some uh, few uh, throw some lights on this sure absolutely so uh, the whole session after these three slides is talking about the exact thing um, so let me go through that and give you a little more deep dive into it, right? Now, this is not as simple as we think uh, uh, could be. An inside sales model is not such an easy thing to do because traditionally, as you said, we are all handshake people. Yeah. Now, the challenge with that is, uh, let me just, uh, okay. oh, sorry about that. I have to put the video off. So I have a little, little bit of bandwidth to share the screen. Okay. Um, so what I was trying to tell you guys is, the success doesn't come um, just by having a sales rep available. The success only come if you have enablement with the sales rep available. What I mean by enablement is today's technology gives you so many tools, right? If you go to Sales Stack 2020, the tools from uh, U-Sales, uh, you will check out a list of tons of tools available in each different category that I'm just listing here. So if you want to do an account-based sales, you want to do marketing analytics, you want to do conferencing, content sharing, contract, like anything from a CRM, if you're not using a you know, CRM yet, you should. Um, and to from a lead generation perspective, there are tools from LinkedIn, Sales Navigator, to uh, Zoom Info, many other things that can help you do many of those functions. Now, what I'm trying to say is to set up an inside sales model, what you need to have is a, a huge benchmark that you need to set up. So. From an outside perspective, you already know what your numbers look like and need to look like. What the challenge here is to how to set that benchmark up front. Considering uh, the perspective of growth your organization might be or how fast you need to run, you need to define your funnel, how would it need to look like? And that could only be done defining what your metrics would be. So some of the metrics basically some people use for is what is the conversion ratio from call to connect, connect to con conversation, conversation to an opportunity, opportunity to a deal, right? But some of the time you also need to look into what is your average revenue per lead, lifetime value, customer acquisition cost, right? These are some critical things that you have to have understanding before you even into step into an inside sales model because that influences a lot of that factors. Now, what is a strategy that you need to have in play? So inside sales model is not simple as uh, somebody sitting behind the desk and making a phone call. As I was trying to explain you all through this while, this needs a little more training. And uh, all set of things can only happen. Uh, let me step uh, to the next slide first. Uh, and high performance team is the only basic objective of having an inside sales model. And if you're not able to drive that, then this model will not help you better. The reason behind is this whole thing is driven behind what is your business model? What is your pricing for the product? How complex is your selling methodology? How complex is your sales? How, how many handshakes you really need to do or how many people do you need to go through to even make a deal? That totally depends upon the, your leadership and strategy. 
if you have a good strategy in play, then it is a lot more easier to simplify and run it down backwards, right? And knowing that you can also create a sales process. Today, if you're not able to do all that handshake is because you're not out there. It doesn't mean that limits you to not pick up a phone or even reach out doing a Zoom call. Now, that is exactly what you need to do using technology. You need to understand what are the different formats available for you to go through and understand what are different information you can gather about a person or a persona. So, Shaiju, the question therefore is, uh, from whatever you're saying, the understanding is that it would uh, definitely take some time for an organization to set up an inside sale. Is that what you're coming to? Like we said about strategy, people, high performance team, infrastructure, uh, dashboards uh, and the training all that put together how long it does uh, take an organization to actually create an inside sales team per se along with the infrastructure uh, shine you uh, just to simply simply answer that question it would not take much time if you have some of these already in place so you know your audience you know what you're okay. trying to reach up to if you you have this understanding you have some of this technology technology can be bought in you know seconds you can go online and you can buy licenses those are available but, but the challenge have, uh, organizations who are in outside sales alone you know they have how do we break this cultural barriers will you be able to give us some idea on that you know an organization predominantly have been on outside sales and as you said it can be done and i, do, I definitely do believe it can be done but how do we break this cultural barriers to get to get into inside sales to begin with in those organizations which had been predominantly onto the outside sales activity for their revenue generation. Yeah, that, so, see, exactly. I, I, one thing I have to, uh, Mr. Nairi, you have to understand is it's not for everyone. Right? Okay. I, okay. Can't, I can't push an inside sales model into somebody who's trying to sell a shampoo, right? Okay. Or I can't push this model into somebody who's trying to sell, uh, you know, groceries. I okay. can't do that. You, what you need to do is you need to understand what industry makes it much more viable to have an inside sales model. Would you because, be therefore be able to give us some idea about those industries and segments where this could be actually played in greater details, uh, Shaitu, please? Sure. So yeah. you know, as everybody knows, the IT world is the best to have this because everybody working for IT would use IT all along. They are driven by information, so they will be all over. Uh, figuring out what information they need. So that's the best place to always have an inside sales because that, that's the place where it is much more uh, not complex, simpler to go to. The second is uh, also the banking and financial verticals because they have their ways of engaging. So there is B2B and there is B2C. So, so between that, you can figure out how you can make a better out of it depending what you're selling. So a credit card is a common example for every time I use is because uh, you can reach out to anybody and ask, hey, would you be interested in a credit card? Um, the answer would be most likely no for everybody. But uh, if you play a nice game with that person, knowing what background is, it will be a lot, lot more simpler. I, uh, a restaurants cannot do an inside sales model. The restaurants can only do a call center model, which is an inbound model, which is to take, you know, inputs in terms of the customer's request. An e-commerce company is purely inbound model. So depending what industry and vertical you are in, uh, like for example, the whole uh, automobile industry is purely driven by inbound, right? Yeah, but I have a, I have another question. Thank you very much. I have another question that is actually, see, do you, uh, will, will you say that, uh, can inside sales and outside sales coexist in an organization, Shaiju? In fact, I would say there are three layers of these kind of industry. So uh, three layers of this system existing in industry. Sorry to correct you. What I'm trying to say is uh, the whole process starts from a MRE, which is your research organization who will figure out what is your list look like. Then comes your SDR model, which is your outbound guys who will make the outbound calls and make sure they get you appointments. Then comes the third way, which is a marketing driven inbound model, which is purely depending on marketing investments and getting the leads from them. These two go on the marketing side of the business. Okay. The sales side of the business is where you actually have inbound or inside sales organization who will pick up these opportunities and try to close them over phone. Uh, obviously, this will not be, you know, $100,000 deals. This can be only, you know, less than $100,000 deals because, uh, you know, you, you know, as the, the amount of the deal go higher, people need to see you, they need to get in trust with you and all of that. So that does not work. Uh, yeah, thank you. So another question before I open it for our audience who had sent us a question is, uh, Shaiju, 
uh, you said about the reputation online and if it is lost, it is so tough and to, to reconnect back. But then there are many instances of organization having lost the reputation. So how do you think it is possible to reconnect and what is, what, 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 how, how can we do it? A reputation that is lost uh, in the inside sales that we do, but we would like to reconnect to a client. Do you have any suggestions on that uh, front, uh, Shaitu? So, um, Mr. Nair, this is all situational question. Okay. Um, there will not be a straightforward answer to it. The reason behind it is what caused that problem needs to be you know, looked at before we even step back. So many times scenarios like I was sharing, one customer was totally unhappy because we didn't give him a proper experience because our guy did not do a proper research when he was trying to reach out. Okay. Uh, and later on, when the other guy reached out who was a little more experienced, was able to address and, and talk to him and give him much more confidence, change the whole perspective. So people are open to get help or ask for help. The only thing is that, are we approaching them correctly? So if that changes many things. That I, that, I, that I understand. But then there is also a possibility the clients going going across during the, the, the SM way, saying that this organization is not worthy to be doing business with. If that sort of a reputation actually happens because of a because of a challenge that you have had with the client. Uh, how do we how do we come back to how do we come back? I understand the situational aspect, but is it possible or do we need to do all over again? Most of the time, uh, there is no straightforward answer to this. <laughs> Certainly, uh, I really need to know why somebody said so. Because sometimes it is because of the bad experience. So because generally, been. our digital marketing advisors tell uh, Shaiju, uh, Shaiju is that once your online reputation is lost, you're lost forever. That's why I just took some time to ask you this question. Uh, which could be true in many cases. You know, if you're a known brand, what does Oracle do when it, uh, somebody is bad-mouthing against it, right? It goes behind and it's all for it they will find some ways to clear that uh, black mark on you. There is always a way to clear black marks on you, but we always need to understand one thing is, why did it come first? And if you are able to solve that, uh, this whole negative element goes away. If you are able to rebrand yourself in terms of how you are doing better, how you are helping people better, the whole perspective of the customers also change. Now, you might need to do a little bit more of brand building activities and spend here and there to get that confidence back, but it will come slowly. Thank you very much. So I'll just take a question from the audience here. Uh, Vaibhav Kaushik wants to know how to uh, how to know if a lead is qualified or not before it is forwarded to an account executive. A fantastic question. That's always a challenge. Now, a couple of things that we need to understand when we're doing a lead qualification. One, uh, whatever products you're selling, you need to know if that product can do that or not. But most importantly, you need to know, some people follow this methodology called band. B-A-N-T, which is budget, thought, the timeline, and need. Uh, if you qualify that, they consider that is qualified. But we end up not asking those hard questions all the time because we are always afraid the customer would not answer these or he might just get lost, right? So until and unless you ask those hard, relevant questions up front, you guys would be wasting your time all the time. So I would always recommend, or rather I push my salespeople before they pass any opportunity to ask them very simple three questions. Is there a clear cut need? There might be always a need, but is the timelines correct? Are they buying in? So they have a budget. Are we talking to the right decision makers? Which is very critical. You need to know this needs to be there. But more importantly, now if you, if you move towards the SaaS world, the software as a, you know, uh, the, uh, service organizations, they need to do a little bit more than that. They need to do medic which is very interesting methodology. People can do research on that and figure out what it is. It is very simple, but you need to have always one another interesting element called customer champion. And if you well, do not have a customer champion in that play, you might not have a deal there. Understand. So that connected to that uh, answer that you had given to the question, there is a question from Sudhagar and I are asking, what are all the hard questions that one failed to ask? Absolutely. Yeah, those are some very critical questions that you need to always ask because uh, we, we always tend to be afraid of asking questions is because we are afraid that customer may be lost. But if we do not ask, we are spending and we're going round and round, ask, you know, not going anywhere with that deal, running six months and one year and that customer will never close. All right. Okay. Here is a question from Akashdeep, uh, Akashdeep Howlader. Okay. He says, uh, uh, what sales script conversation guidebooks, if any, you can refer to for getting the practice of consultative value-based assistive selling. Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> Akash, 
there is no guidebook in the world to talk to you about that. But what I would do recommend is there are a lot of coaches on online available. I would you know name you some. John Barrows is one who is one of the you know the latest trendiest coach uh, in the industry who can. There are a lot of videos about it. How to make those hard questions? How to create your questions? But one thing I would say: do not go by a script. You cannot have a script. If you are doing a script, then you're a call center. You will be answering, hey, how are you doing? I, how, how best can I answer your questions and all of that? But rather, you should be a conversational person, as you right. would be on the field too. Great. Yeah, I really appreciate it because you can't go by a script here. So script is out of question. Okay, another question has come from an anonymous section. He says, how inside sales can work where physical products should be demonstrated to customers? Or how inside sales and outside sales team work to work co-efficiently? There are two questions in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's take the, the later questions for co-efficiently. Yeah. Okay, guys, you need to understand the guys who are on the field are much more experienced and they have literally years and years of experience on the field doing this, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, we respect that. We need to respect that. And the people who are on inside sales does not mean that they are not having much more experience. But what we do have with them is the facility to be available all the time to make sure the customers are uh, looked after and taken care of. And what I mean to do is, if you have a, a pre-tier system, which is one is your research team, one is your SDR team, who's doing basically the meeting setup and qualification. The next thing that you need to do on a high volume sales, not a high velocity sales, a high ARPU or a high MRR or a high deal value, you know is to go meet the customer, right? For those scenarios, this would make a huge difference to have a core relationship where an SDR passes effective lead or an efficient lead to that field team so they can take over and make the things happen from there on. And the first question? Uh, sorry, I, could you come back on the first question? How, how in sales, sales can work where physical products should be demonstrated to customers? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky question there because I cannot demonstrate an entire uh, you know, robotic arm on a Zoom, right? But fortunately, if I do know what they're really looking for and if I have done the proper homework and a discovery call with the customer in terms of understanding its real need, it could be as simple as doing a review for a Honda Civic. Right. So if you look at uh, today, if you go type for Honda Civic reviews, there are huge, huge list of people doing reviews online about every inch of that product. And similarly, if it, even if it's a robotic arm, doesn't mean that I can't do that over Zoom or a video or something. I can always do that and send it across to them and also get on a, a Zoom call or a Go meeting or something like that and, and do much more conversation there. That's, uh, that's always possible. Only intention is who you're talking to. Is that audience literate enough to understand this on a content that you're providing? Thank you, Shaiju. Another question is, which tool you have found most useful for inside sales? Calls, LinkedIn, what others? Uh, that's a tricky question again, guys, so because um, none of them works all the time. Right? There is no thumb rule in sales. If you say you can you know, mail blast thousands of emails every day and expect uh, to drip down one or two leads out of it, yes, you can. But that's not more effective way of doing it. Much more effective way to do it is to get personalized, right? And the personalization can only happen if you have done the research homework about that person and everything around it to reach out on a very constructive email uh, as well. Phone calls generally is you know, 30 seconds. If you were leaving a voicemail, it's 30 seconds or it's five minutes if somebody's over a call, but that's too limited. So you have to be very precise if you're doing it. Um, my thing is go all the way out, do many things possible because until it, the customer says no to you, the deal still exists. All right. So this question from Manoj Kumari asks, uh, in traditional sales, we used to meet customers, discuss with them, make relationship, which can give us long-term business. How, how can we set up this in a rural sector? Maybe this is it. Maybe this is okay in Canada or US, but how can this be done in rural sector? That's a question from Manoj. Uh, that, that's an interesting question. Manoj, I will ask you a question back. If you understand how the grocery industry or, or the whole consumer industry works, you will figure out those guys who are out of stock only makes one phone call to their you know, agency guys to make sure they have stock enough, right? And how does that happen? That whole thing only happens once you build one-time relationship. 
and that could doesn't need to be in person anymore. Now everybody understand you can do uh, a face, you know, rather a video call over a phone, right? So everybody has that Geo app or or Airtel app or everything that you can do a face call or a FaceTime with somebody over a phone or a laptop. Now, if you are able to uh, do that and that person is technology savvy, they will be your best people because they also know they don't have to wait a long time to make a phone call to here and all of that and then go through that logistics again. But it's a lot more easier to just pin you or text you and say, hey, I need this thought. Can you make sure that comes through? Right? It's, it's a lot more simpler. And some of these can also happen if you have been doing a good service to them for a long time. And if you have built that relationship, it becomes much more simpler. All right. Vaibhav Kumar Solanki is asking you, is this question, is uh, inside sales suitable for SaaS products sold to B2B customers in MSME segment? If yes, to what extent and how to go about it? Um, to answer you, uh, in Freshworks, I am dealing with SME segment alone. And my Very product good. is yeah. SaaS. My product is SaaS. And if Freshworks can grow to become a unicorn only on the basis of having SME do the largest business and revenue source for them, uh, whoever you are, you can always you know, be successful if you have the right strategy in place. Oh, next question from Azhar Umar. He has, uh, he's asking, how effective would inside sales be for B2B companies? It's very effective. It's very effective in a way that nobody wants to spend any more time face to face. They're all running around. They do not want to travel. Uh, our travel today, you know, just to give you a basic example, I, I left Bangalore because I'm tired of driving in, in the traffic. To even to reach office, I need to start two hours earlier than required. And that's it's scary. That's a very scary time frame because if I need to be from Chennai, if I have to go meet a customer in Bangalore, not I need to prepare just a five hour travel time from Chennai to Bangalore. I also need to plan up three hours ahead so that I don't get stuck in traffic to meet a person. So if you understand the challenges as we grow bigger and bigger, uh, the world is getting smaller in terms of how you commute and what you're doing. Um, most of the time we will end up doing everything remotely. Soon enough, we will do that remotely as we are already doing it today. Very good. Uh, anonymous attendee is asking this question. What would be common quality in inside sales team and field sales team? The common quality of inside sales team and the field sales team. One thing everybody needs to understand, this is sales. You have to have a sales tactics and a sales skill set uh, basically available to you. If you're not a sales savvy person, it's not for you, right? The many times I come with, uh, you know, the, the, we end up hiring from colleges directly, who are freshers, who come in, oh, I am from a fancy college and I want to do something. And if they end up sitting and trying to make 100 calls a day, they don't like it. So you have to figure out what is the best talent out there who has either done it or willing to do it. And if you do not have the basic mindset of, okay, listen, sales is not about selling products. It's about helping people out with what they absolutely, don't absolutely. know. Then it, it's a total mind game. Very well said. Karamjit Singh is asking this question as to what are the different, what's the sales channel to try? Uh, sorry, come again with that question. What are the different worth sales channel to try? Uh, it's a very confusing question. There, there is only a couple of channels to use in an inside sales business. Either a okay. phone call or an email or do you know Zoom calls or something like that. Those are the limited ways of engaging a customer apart from social selling or social media engagement, right? Um, if you're asking if there is a different channel to engage, I'm not going to go meet the customer any day. Right. I've been running, you know, millions of dollar revenue from India for US and Canada for many years now. Do you ask me how many customers know me in person? None. Right. So there's no direct channel to say, uh, you know, that's going to work. But the limited channels that you can use, those are emails, phone calls, voicemails, Zoom calls, LinkedIn and every other form of technology available that lets you reach somebody. That's all it is. Does WhatsApp help, uh, uh, Shaiju? Uh, sorry? WhatsApp, WhatsApp as an application. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So any, any, media, any media that lets you directly to the customers and let them hear you is all that you need, right? So if, you, if you're asking what is more important, today if I'm talking to a customer over phone and he's not taking my call, I know I need to WhatsApp him to check if he's available. Absolutely, absolutely. Normally, another anonymous attendee is asking this question. Inside, 
outbound sales is it better to send emails first followed by cold call or is it the other way around um it totally depends again guys um it depends on what you're doing if you're selling a credit card it's always better on calls because email is not going to be read uh because it will be on a spam but if you're selling a complex product like uh, what freshworks does then you know your audience is interested because you have defined them clearly so for example i need to sell a fresh desk which is a customer support solution i know what kind of personas i need to reach out to i need to reach out to an it manager but i also need to reach out to the ceo of the company to make sure that his customers are listened right so if you say either this or that i do not have a straightforward answer for you but i know that sometimes it is better to call uh than to email and sometimes it's better to email so for example i will give you one tip that i give to my reps is if you are reaching a higher rep like c level executives or even the vp level executives it is better to send them a personalized customized email first and then follow up on that but Wait. if you're trying to reach to somebody lower than that or an it manager somebody pick up the phone and dial because these guys are always available right another question from prashil p nath he's asking apart from cold calling what are the other methods that can be used to get connected to decision maker in kerala market what about kerala market i don't know uh <laughs> that's a very specific question i don't know how to answer that but i i guess guys it totally um then again you need to understand if kerala is the highest literacy uh proven state i assume everybody at least use whatsapp right uh so if you're not confident about see the challenge is to get their numbers first and most of the time you might not get their numbers first and emails is the last thing that a kerala like would look into if he's not into an it business or it's not let's to make you know looking into emails uh but what is easier to get to is figure out if there is a way uh to get to in a mass audience like facebook everybody is on facebook everybody is on twitter reach out to them over there or linkedin and see if they are interested if they are not picking phones and emails that's the only way to go about right this question is from vinesh nirmal i would like to know how long can we go like this okay in the vinesh pishuna he says what would be your suggestion for a company which is into b2b e-commerce sales of high value products which needs both inside uh, inside sales but a touch and feel as well as relationship management for maximum customer lifetime value what would be your suggestion for a company which is into b2b e-commerce sales of high value sales products about needing both inside and outside sales i would say that's the best combination you have already figured because uh, you know uh, inside can only do so much guys uh, your revenues are totally what is driving you as a company then you need to understand if customers are not happy over the phone they will tell you hey come meet us most of the time in my business also i have customers who say hey listen we are doing all this business over phone but i need you to come and implement this in person that does happen so if you have that uh, combined model together it's fantastic the only thing is you need to make sure that they are having a proper handshake and you know follow it up rather than everything else around thanks sir shai ju dishant ayer wants to know how do you start what do you do when you have just one person and how do you build up a build up from there that is your inside sales team something that i asked at the beginning right uh, you know it, it's it's always the that question that comes into a new business or a startup because he's unaware of what he needs to do but all i want you to tell you is to go back into your core business figure out what you want to accomplish you want to grow you want to grow how fast and before you do so you have to go down basic things what is your short term goal if you know what is your short term goal then walk backwards to figure out what your audience should look like who can buy who cannot buy and then start doing a basic thing is to do a test market do a ab testing figure out a certain set of audience reach out to them see what is the response and then figure out another set of audience and reach out and do a testing and then see what is the best what we learned rather what i learned running my own business was always look at things what is not working do a deep dive into it to figure out why is it not working and then that gives you a better hand in terms of whatever is working how much more on top of that you can add to make it much more better okay why book second question so anyway but it's a good question so i'm asking uh, is the approach of inside sales different with customers in india and abroad is there any specific challenge which is present in one and absent in another you specifically asking between indian customers and outside customers which is fine um 
which is actually true. Uh, in fact, if you would have told me, um, you know, 10 years back that, hey, inside sales is not relevant for India, I would have agreed because I was doing that business from here and it was very tough to get into somebody's phone call and do all of that because they were not, they were not used to having a telephone call to do a business. They were always like, hey, come to my office, see me here, see me there. Uh, let's do this, let's do that. But, you know, what happens? Uh, you know, you go to their meeting room and they're like, hey, wait for me, I have another meeting. And that continues. And you never end up getting anywhere with them. So what I figured is 10 years before it was that way, but today, as most of these guys who are running businesses or startups are people who have actually expats or have come back or have done business abroad, they know the value of telephone calls more than any time before, right? One. Second, the people today are changing because smartphones have made the life a lot more easier. So everybody's hooked to their phones rather than you know, waiting for somebody to come over. There are traditional people who you can't change, but I would not guarantee that I can help you change them anyways. What I can do is basically help you figure out if you know a company is new and is a new gen company and there are new gen people who are running that business, they will pick your call. Uh, Shaji, could you switch off your uh, sort of your, your presentation and come live on the screen? That would have been wonderful because people are missing you too. I mean, they are not able to see you actually. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Shaji, thank you. I think uh, we can uh, stop yeah, we the, the screen yeah, share uh, yeah, now. Yeah, that is right. Yeah. All right. Let uh, me do we, that. Yeah. Nirmal has uh, told me that uh, this should be a last question. Uh, maybe uh, I'll start with this and if time permits, one more. This is Kamal Rotela. He's asking, how do you decide if a product or service qualifies for an inside sales? In other words, are there some features of the product service that makes them qualified for inside sales? Is a question that is asked. Wow. <laughs> I never thought that way. Uh, honestly, guys, uh, you know, you can even sell a pencil or phone today, right? Now, there are smart pencils which can automatically write on a different kind of a pad you provide. Basically, it's a, it's a technology, right? doesn't need to be like this that you need to determine which product can sell or which cannot, cannot sell to an inside sales model. The only reason behind that is you need to figure out what is your audience look like? What is your market look like? And how vast do you need to go to? If you are in a B2C model, you know you have to reach as many people as you need to to get one thing sold. Similarly, if you're in a B2B business, you know you only have a handful of people to reach out to and that you need to make maximum out of it. Mostly that defines how you pick your a business model and then products or services just adds in terms of how you can represent it. If it's a physical product, how would you represent it? If it's a you know software technology or something, how would you present that? Uh, that determines the rest of the workflow. Guys, uh, there had been a lot of questions. Questions keep coming in, but I can't take it all. We will, uh, Nirmal has already given me the cutoff. But one last question for you, Shaiju. I think great uh, to have interacted with you. And this is the last question. Sudhir Nandiala is asking this question. Is, uh, it's true that buyers, uh, buyer, it is, it, sorry, it's true that the buyer's journey is 70% completed by the time a salesperson is contacted, but still he demands for a home demo. He wants one of the executive to come to his home and show the product demo for, to close the deal. How do we convince them on a same call, on a, on a same call and close the deal without a home demo? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, dear, you need to understand, I hope you're not selling a car because if you're selling a car, then he wants to see it at home, right? Uh, but uh, it, it's a very tricky situation. It's like a catch-22, right? Which came first? Is your product come first or is the customer come first? You have to be very careful when you uh, pick these two lines. Um, because most of the time, um, if your customers are not tech savvy, this would happen. And there is no other way to you know, do it. You have to go present it and do it. But sometimes it is easier that uh, you send them some videos first before you go there. You send them videos, you send some pictures, you tell them some elaborate uh, you know, presentation, not a PPT deck, rather a, a clear cut, a click here, click there kind of a thing, or touch here, touch there kind of a thing and, and video do it. So they see it live. Sometimes it's a lot more easier to do a live presentation. This is what I did. I used to be a car salesman before, right? And once a guy was calling from Dubai and saying, hey, I want to buy a car. I'm like, huh? And I'm in Trishur, by the way. <laughs> a guy calling from Dubai and I'm trying to sell a car to a guy in Dubai. In Trishur, not possible. 
what I ended up figuring out, there needs to be something which is common. Then YouTube was common. I created a video, sent him. He's like, hey, listen, you're not showing me this. You're not showing me that. You're hiding me many things. I'm like, oh God, what, what kind of trouble I am in? And then what I did is, okay, let's do this. Then there was go-to meeting, which was available for free for one or two users. I picked that up and said, hey, listen, we're going to go do this. I'm going to go live. I'm going to use my mobile and show you all of this with my laptop running around as well. Uh, within a Wi-Fi connectivity. As much as I can show you, you can ask me questions around it. And it was like, okay, let's do it. So that's how I solved that problem. Uh, if you ask me, Dave, there is a straight way to do it. I, unfortunately, there is nothing. Thank you, Shaj. It had been a, indeed a pleasure con conversing with you. So nice. You know the subject uh, so damn well, and uh, you've been able to answer most of the guys uh, with aplomb. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll continue to look forward. I mean, looking forward to continue our association together. I would uh, now ask uh, uh, Nirmal to come in uh, and do the rest of the coordination. So, like, for the thanks. Appreciate Nirmal, that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that interesting uh, note. We have more questions. We have close to 45 to 50 odd questions. Uh, so I request participants will share. Uh, will probably share the presentation that you did uh, with the participants and also your email ID. They can uh, send you mails directly and. You know, shoot their questions there. That would be good. Uh, before we conclude, uh, I request our charter member, Mr. Anandamani, who's online, uh, to do the vote of thanks. Good evening, Professor Dajit, uh, S, uh, and uh, colleague SR, entire time uh, members, and the speaker, Mr. Shaiju Thomas. In fact, we had a very interesting and deep analysis webinar talk on how to crack the inside states and why it is more important now. Mr. Shaiju has uh, given a detailed uh, narration of how technology is going to change the landscape of the sale and how social media is going to boost the success. And much more was this emphasizing point on the influencing factors on a decision to make sales both inside and outside. He had uh, gone much uh, deep, deep into the thing, branching the many stages of the thing. And I hope the entire attendees uh, I've got a fair sense of what the future holds in terms of the sales in the post-COVID times and how they should shape the future of the firm they are leading so as to be survive in the post-COVID times by developing new habits or developing new attitudes and how to be more self-aware. Thanking you once more, Mr. Shaiju, for this interesting session. So before I conclude, I wish to uh, inform the entire attendees that TICL is initiating the next virtual session on managing family business in uncertain times uh, tomorrow, uh, that is Friday, 24th April at 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. You can see it on the screen by Professor Kavil Ramachandran. Do register in advance for this virtual session using the link that is being provided out over there. A brief profile of Professor Kavil Ramendran is that he is the executive director of Thomas Mindley Center for Family Enterprises in Indian School of Business, Hyderabad. He was also the founding faculty set up at the Wadwani Center of Entrepreneurship Development at the Indian School of Business in 2001. And currently, he is the executive director of the Center for Family Enterprises at the Indian School of Business. He has specialized in family business, entrepreneurship, and strategy and has over 30 years of combined experience as an academic at the Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad and Indian School of Business, Hyderabad. So attendees, never miss this uh, another valuable uh, webinar like today's, which is again, uh, you are going to have one more thing tomorrow. Do register right away itself. So thanks a lot once more, Mr. Shaiju and the entire attendees and the entire Thai team. Over to you, Nirmal. Thank you, Shaiju. Salute. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity, guys. Thank you, Shaiju. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, all participants. Uh, the link to the next program will be shared with you over a mail and uh, you know, WhatsApp communication. Please do join tomorrow. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Thank you guys.